So today I'm spilling Lipton. I'm spilling all the tea on how I went from being an Ivy League pre-med double major to an Ivy League double degree alumna who graduated with the highest honors. I've been asked on multiple platforms to make a video that basically talks about my academic lore in depth from the study techniques that I use to graduate with the highest honors to how I balance my schedule as a pre-med and a double major to how I got involved into research and did my own research projects. So I'm going to be addressing all of that here and if there's anything that i don't cover that you're curious about please leave a comment or a question below and we will get into it in the future for sure let's just go ahead and kick off with some introductions for those of you who don't know me hey my name is Kay, I'm also known as barbie brains i am a content creator primarily on tiktok and instagram and now youtube and i like to combine my passions which are everything to do with brainy academic educational stuff and everything to do with beauty makeup cute fashion fun stuff so that's what this channel kind of is it's a catch-all for all of my interests now that established i am more importantly a recent graduate of the university of pennsylvania um, i graduated this past may and i graduated summa cum laude um highest honors with degrees in neuroscience and something that Penn has called health and societies, we'll unpack what that is later, and also a minor in chemistry. So let's just kick this off with a little bit about my academic background because a lot of people are curious as to how I even got to being a double major, what my reasoning for that is, and basically what propelled me to do that. So I was somebody who always knew that I wanted to come into college as a pre-med because I knew that I wanted to eventually matriculate onto medical school and become a physician. So that meant that I came in already aware of the fact that there were courses that I needed to take in order to fill the pre-medical requirements. Um, at Penn, there are two majors that happen to really coincide with the pre-medical requirements and they are biology and neuroscience. As somebody who's super interested in the human brain um, and also human behavior, neuroscience was like the obvious choice for me because it was just, it seemed more interesting to me than the biology tracks that were offered at Penn. So I decided I was gonna do neuroscience coming into college. Um, then I took a class, literally my first semester at Penn called medical sociology. And it was revolutionary, groundbreaking, never before seen. Like I was obsessed. And I found it to be so intriguing because it talked a lot about what motivated me to basically become a physician, which was the people, the populations. It talked about all of these systemic structures that impacted patient care and impacted how marginalized people engage with medicine. And I just, I just fell in love. So I did a little bit of research and figured, because I was trying to figure out how can I incorporate this into my undergraduate education because I want to do more of whatever this is because this is the type of work that I hope to be involved in as a physician in the future. And I quickly realized that the Health and Societies major, which is another really big major for pre-meds at Penn, perfectly encapsulated all of those interests. Um, the Health and Societies major at Penn falls within the History and Sociology of Science department and it is often referred to by you know undergrads as HSOC, um, which is kind of an abbreviation for the department name. Now. Health and Societies also offers concentrations for undergrads, so you can do like race, you can do gender, you can do bioethics, you can do law, and you can do public health. I chose to concentrate in public health, so my second degree is Health and Societies with a concentration in public health. And within that degree, I was able to explore a lot about medical history, history of science, and particularly archival history. Now, basically the way that my academic trajectory worked was I got accepted to Penn. I started as a neuroscience person. Um, at Penn, you don't have to actually declare any majors until you're a sophomore, but I already kind of knew I was going to do neuroscience. And then my second semester freshman year, I decided to officially add the health and societies major. And from there, the rest is history because neuroscience pretty much aligned with all of the pre-medical requisites. Um, and it was basically all the pre-med recs and then five additional neuroscience specific classes. So it was pretty easy for me to plan out how I needed to take the courses and in what order. And then health and societies, I really just use those classes as like my break classes. And the reason why I'm saying that is because I'm somebody who really, really enjoys reading and writing. That is something that comes pretty easily to me. So I never found HSOC classes to be particularly stressful. Like I'm the kind of person that would rather write a 30 page paper than do a final exam. So for some context, I pretty much would consider my STEM and more like neuro classes as being like really rigorous and challenging for me because I had, you know, educational gaps. I was coming from, you know, high school in Georgia that, girl, like, I didn't even really have to take some classes that other people had taken like extensive 
extensively in high school. So when I came to Penn, I was kind of definitely a little, little like a little bit academically behind because I never actually had to take like calculus for real, for real. Um, I never took like as many semesters of chemistry as other people had taken in high school. So there was just a lot going on. Um, so I found my STEM classes and the neuro major to be challenging because I was coming in already kind of a little bit behind of where I think a lot of my professors expected me to be. And the classes in general were just hard. Um, HLOC is hard too in its own in its own right. Like reading and writing is not very easy, but because that was a strong suit that I had coming in, I found that major to be like super slay, super like super T. I loved it. Long story short, I decided that I was gonna double major and the way that I would split my classes up was I would typically take like three hard science neuro pre-med classes and then I would take like two to three health and societies like history, sociology, HSOC classes and that would be my balance. Let's get into the actual study techniques that I use. Basically, I had to develop a wide array of study techniques because of the fact that I was going between a lot of different academic disciplines. I was in biology, I was doing chemistry, I was doing um, history, I was doing sociology, I was doing like a lot of different things. So let's just break down some of the study techniques that I used in order to be successful in my classes in undergrad. I'm gonna start with the more traditional STEM classes and pre-med classes because this is what I'm more often asked about. And then we're gonna move into like the history and the more like other subjects. Um, but to start with, um, for my neuroscience, biology, chemistry, more memorization science classes, I enjoyed doing what I like to call mind maps. And this study technique is something that I kind of Frankenstein together, but it is a combination of several already existing study techniques. Now, what a mind map is, is it's basically a combination of a flashcard, Cornell notes, and a thought map or like a web map I don't know what they're exactly called but you know those maps where you like will put a subject in the center and then you'll branch off and like write stuff around it that's related to that subject it's basically formatted like that and I'm going to show an image actually because um, I have some pulled up on my trusty iPad but I'm also going to just overlay so you guys can better see what I'm talking about but essentially um, like I said a mind map is like a giant flash card and where the Cornell notes format comes in is that everything is basically phrased like a question and an answer and then organize everything in like a flow. So as concepts came to me, that's how I'd write them down. Um, now, for an example, let's look at one of the mind maps that I made for biology when we were doing our animal behavior unit. Now, my goal for each mind map was to essentially put all of the content from one unit or one chapter on one page. and basically use that page like a gigantic flashcard. So in the center of the page, I would put the focal subject, and then around that, I would branch off with all of the content that was related to that central subject. So for example, looking at my animal behavior mind map, you'll see that I have in the center, obviously the title, animal behavior, and then around it, I have a bunch of different topics like Tenenberg's questions, how did behavior evolve, communication, artificial selection, like all of these things that are related to the topic. You'll notice that I'm using two colors for my mind map, dark blue and light blue. Um, somebody asked me once, like, why do I use the color blue? I read a study a long time ago that showed that blue was helpful for cognition and memory, and I simply never questioned that and I ran with it. Um, whether you take that with a grain of salt, I also just like the color blue, so that's why I use it. Um, but yeah, so for my mind maps, I would basically just write um, all the content around, and I would just do it in a Cornell note question answer format. And basically, once I filled up the entire map and had all of my questions in dark blue and all the answers in light blue, I would create a blank version of the map. And the blank versions looked like this, where only the dark blue questions remained. And basically, my job would be to then fill in all of the light blue content that I had, you know, written in on the original non-erased version of the map. And what this helped me do was basically just like recall a lot of information and also get accustomed to writing out the information. Because for me, um, or at least at Penn, back in my 50 years when I was there, a lot of my exams were written response. So it was literally just me versus the page. So I would not only need to be able to vaguely recall and identify something enough to get it right in a multiple choice question, but I would also need to be able to like write it out and explain the thing. So. Making these mind maps was super, super helpful because it really just ensured that I was focused and engaged and retaining the information and was also able to regurgitate information in a succinct, in-depth, written response type of format. So this is what I did for pretty much 
all of my biology neuro classes that were very memorization heavy. I'm gonna now show you an example from chemistry because I often get a lot of questions about what I had going on in chemistry and I will say um, giant reactions list for organic chemistry that um, was very different than a mind map but kind of a similar concept. Basically what I did was every single reaction that I ever learned for organic chemistry I wrote it on this big table. And this is multiple pages because I used the same exact sheet and just kept building on it for all of chemistry because organic chemistry builds on each other. And I would write the reaction, the product, the um, stereochemistry, regiochemistry, and the mechanism, and the arrows. Because when I was taking organic chemistry, um, I had to write all of the arrows and all the, like it was, it was, it was we was in there. So um, this table is what I would use. And basically what I would do was I would have the reaction product, um, all of these uh, things written out. And I had a blank version of the table and I would basically just challenge myself to, you know, fill in all of the blanks. So I would have to recall the reaction, the product, regional stereochemistry, and then also the mechanism. So it's a very similar idea to the flashcard-esque thing that I have going except I just made this a little bit more tailored for organic chemistry because obviously organic chemistry is a bit different. Um, that said though, the mind maps, um, I have several examples I'm gonna just flash across the screen so that you can kind of see all the different variations that I did them in. Um, I would make tweaks based off the classes and whatnot, but generally it's like the same, it's the same concept. Another thing that I would often do um, for my STEM classes, and this is particularly before exams and like final exams, was I would make big cheat sheets. And what the cheat sheets would be would be a summary of everything that was the most relevant from the class. Basically the class's greatest hits. And I would just put them on, you know, a big sheet. And I would just go over these sheets um, before my exam regularly and make sure that I had all of the big heavy hitting concepts down. So doing a combination of these things, like making the mind maps, challenging myself to the mind maps consistently, making cheat sheets before all the exams so that I could really practice um, combining the information in a way that made sense to me, and then making sure that I could just recall everything was really my approach and what I found most effective for my like memorization heavy traditional science classes. Now, for my classes like physics and math, I just would do a bunch of practice problems. I would get practice problems from my professor, I would look up practice problems online, I would just go heavy and go hard in the practice problems and in the textbooks until I could solve the problems with no sweat. Because basically for those classes, there are only so many different ways that you can solve like a physics problem. There's only so many different ways that you can ask me about um, projectile motion. There's only so many different styles of questions that you can ask me related to that topic. So I would just basically learn every single question type and drill myself on them until they made sense. Now, for theology classes, these classes, to be quite real with you, I just found them so interesting that I took my standard notes, like I would write down um, everything that I need to know for the class, you know, I would do my readings, I would highlight my readings and stuff. Um, I don't think that I did anything particularly phenomenal or outstanding. I like I would just read and highlight in a way that made sense to me. I can do it. I can get into that though in another video if you guys are genuinely interested. But for right now, we'll skip that. Um, but yeah, like I would just mark up my readings before class. My more like history-based classes that had like traditional history exams where I was just recalling a lot of stuff, I would similarly do what I did for my other classes and just make big cheat sheets and just drill the information until I remembered it um, because that was what worked for me. In terms of the actual papers, what this is kind of what I found to be the most helpful and kind of like a unique thing that I did. I would make very, very thorough um, skeleton outlines and these would basically be the backbone to a lot of my papers. I got really good at writing papers really fast um, because I would often have semesters where I would have like three final exams and then three like 15 to 20 page papers, which could be overwhelming. So what I would do was I would make these outlines and I'm gonna flash them on the screen so that you can see what I'm talking about as I'm describing it. But I would make these outlines and um, 
they would basically just go in a stepwise process. Um, basically, the way that these outlines would work would be I have the general title, um, the introduction, and then I would just start off with some Roman numerals, one, two, three, four, and I would break down, like, typically to start with, one sentence about what I thought I was going to talk about in that paragraph. Just one sentence. And I would just flesh out kind of the entire body of the paper. Um, typically, I would have my introduction and then like, five to six little numerals, depending on how long the paper was supposed to be, um, with my topic sentence written out at the top, and then I would have the conclusion at the bottom. And then I would basically just build up the outline from there. So I would go back under all of my topic sentences and flesh out a couple, like no more than four sentences about what I wanted the gist and the main point of the paragraph to be. Once I had those four sentences, I would just kind of build around it. I would add in, okay, what supporting information do I need to include in order to make sure that these this is the gist and the takeaway um, from this paragraph. And then before you know it, you've filled up the entire paper. And all you need to do is add like some transition sentences to make stuff, you know, kind of flow and be cohesive. So that was my approach that I found really, really helpful. I used to be very anti-outlining before I started having to write long papers. And then once I started getting hit with long papers, I was like, hold on, wait a minute. I need outline. I need outline. Real big. But I found that doing this like baby step process of like, okay, now I'm doing the topic sentence. Now I'm writing three to four sentences. Now I'm adding in the supporting information. Now I'm at a full paper was really helpful and made everything feel a lot less daunting. Those were my primary study techniques. Now in undergrad, I also did a neuroscience honors thesis. I graduated um, with an honors degree in neuroscience. The honors thesis was basically me doing my own independent research project. My independent research project was finished my junior year, which was a year early because I didn't have no chill at all and I didn't want to do it my senior year, but I did want to get the honors and I felt like, okay, I'm gonna just do it as a junior. So it was me doing a year of independent research. Penn basically would build it out to where you could pick a mentor, whoever you wanted, and you could work in their lab for a year and basically produce your own independent research project. So that's how I got involved with that. Um, people often ask me like, oh, how did you do a thesis in undergrad? It was just something that Penn, it's quite common at Penn to do a thesis in your major, or have the ability to do a thesis in your major. The ways that I got involved into research was honestly just by cold emailing people. I would just say, hey yo, you look cool, like your stuff look nice. And obviously I would say in a lot more sophisticated way than that. I'll actually pop up what my email template was on the screen so that you guys can reference it. But I would literally just cold email people and I would send follow ups because what gets people is that you get discouraged after somebody doesn't answer. Not me. I would send one, two, three. Three was my limit though. I wouldn't send more than three emails, but I would send like I would follow up. I wouldn't be shy to follow up because a lot of what I learned is that people in academia, especially people who are really doing cool stuff and are really busy, have email blockers. So the first time that you email them as like a one off random email, it might not even hit their main inbox. But if you said a follow up to be like, hey, I'm not a robot, respond, um, they typically would. If you are sleeping on um, research internships, lock in, lock in. A lot of them actually close in January. It's November, lock in. And what I would do was I would just look up on Google like health services research internship, public health research internship. Literally just Google it. Like that's how you get involved in research. So cold emailing and genuinely just putting yourself out there and applying for a bunch of stuff. That's like the gist of like the main highlights of my undergrad experience. If y'all have other questions, because I know that there are several questions that I probably did not answer in this video, feel free to leave them below. But that generally covers the gist of, you know, my academic background briefly, like why I decided to double major, how I balanced it the study techniques that I use in order to, you know, be a successful double major, and then how I got involved in different research opportunities while I was an undergrad. So I hope that this was helpful and I will see you guys in the next video.